Hello, my name is Michael Neal, and I'm an associate professor of English um, at Florida State University. At Florida State, we have um, writers that span from, I get to teach in a department with um, the college composition program, which includes a freshman and sophomore level writing class, uh, a major called editing, writing, and media, and graduate students in rhetoric and composition. Uh, so I get to I get to teach and work with writers at all levels. Um, even though we're a large university, our writing classes are small. They're under 20 students per class. Uh, so even this kind of presentation, where it's more of a lecture style presentation for about 20 minutes, is not necessarily in my wheelhouse. It's not something that I do very often. Usually in classes, we're discussing uh, texts. Students are talking, we're interacting, we're in small groups. Um, we know each other's names and talk to one another, but it is my pleasure to have a chance, even in this video format, to be able to talk um, towards you, at you, through the screen uh, for just a few minutes about something that I think is quite important uh, when it comes to writing. Uh, my presentation today is, is titled Adaptable Approaches to Reasoning and Organization in College Writing, and I am going to focus on that idea of adaptability. Um, I'll start by saying that I've been teaching writing for about 25 years at an, in a number of different institutional contexts. And one thing that I've heard quite often when I sit in on a writing classes or hear about writing classes is I'll hear the instructor say something toward the beginning of class like, hey, I want you to forget everything that you learned about writing before this class and I'm going to start over and we're going to rebuild from here. Well, when I first heard that, I thought that was curious, but I didn't pay it a whole lot of attention. Uh, one of the things that I learned as a writing instructor early on is that students aren't tabula rasa, that idea that you're not a, bl a blank slate. You come to the writing classroom with a rich um, amount of experiences in the world and, uh, and with writing of different kinds. Um, and I, I find it curious because uh, I can't imagine any other discipline that would sort of have that approach to, um, to their subject matter where you'd say, forget what's come before. My wife is a middle school math teacher, and I can't imagine she would ever say, forget what you learned in Algebra 1, now we're in Algebra 2, we're going to start all over. Of course, they're going to be, um, you know, uh, building on what they've done in the past. History the same way. Maybe you study world history one year and American history the next. Your American history uh, teacher wouldn't say to you, hey, forget about world history, now we're just studying America, right? We're, um, you know, we build on what we, what we learn. Another example might be my son's a guitar player. And maybe in his first um, year of guitar lessons, he's learning some basic chords. When he gets into more advanced guitar classes, he's, the teacher's not going to say, now forget those chords and we're going to move on to something more complex. We build on what we've done before. But I think I understand what the writing teachers are saying. There are certain things that you might learn um, that are sort of um, truisms in a particular situation, and maybe your writing teacher this year or whatever your year wants you to build on that, wants you to do something different with it. There are actually very few always or never rules when it comes to writing. Um, I hear a lot of students who come into college say, well, my teacher told me never to use I or you in a sentence, or, or always you never have a, a single sentence paragraph, or never start a sentence with a conjunction. You know, so you learn these kind of rules and there's a reason for that. And I wanna acknowledge that there are reasons for that. But then when you look at writing as it exists in the world, there are really good writers who have one sentence paragraphs who use I and you and we all the time. And so, um, so that's why I think adaptability is important. There's this sense that um, I want you to be able to think as a writer, especially with reasoning and organization, that there are certain strategies you might be learning now that are absolutely effective for what you're learning now. But then when you get into college and when you get beyond uh, AP language, regardless of what you get on the exam, um, that there might be some more to learn. The, the most um, the exciting and frustrating thing about writing is that you never, you never fully arrive as a writer to a point where you have nothing more to learn. I write professionally. I write articles and try to write books. I've written one book and things that happen. And, and I'm still learning about to, to be a better writer. I'm still learning reasoning and organization skills. I'm still analyzing audiences and doing rhetorical analyses and all these things. So what I hope to establish today is that writing and especially thinking about adaptable approaches to reasoning and organization is sort of a habit of mind. Um, it's, it's a way to think about text so that we don't get stuck into that mentality thinking there's one correct way to write. Um, there are multiple ways to write. So I am focusing on reasoning or, and organization. AP language puts those two things together in a particular unit for a reason. Uh, reasoning is, you know, thinking, critical thinking, evidence, arguments, and so forth. Um, it's, it's, um, it's sort of um, 
what you're saying and, and um, it's the content of what you're saying. And our brains make sense of the world through logic and our brains make sense of the world through organization. Organization is related to that, right? It's structure, organization, patterns, and so forth. Um, our brains are meaning-making machines, and we look to make, to see relationships between parts to make a whole so that we can understand something, and we do that through reasoning and organization. If you don't, just one quick example of how, how you can sort of understand the, the pattern part of, of meaning making. Imagine thousands and thousands of years ago, people were staring up in the sky and they're seeing like 20 dots up in the sky of different stars. Well, someone looked at those dots and said, you know what, that looks like a horse with a rider and a bow and arrow on it. How in the world do, do they do that? Well, it's because the brain is looking for patterns and connections between things. And, um, and honestly, what, we're, what we wanna look at today is thinking about the more complex the ideas that you have, the more complex the patterns and organization and reasoning might be. So what we start with in education are pretty simple patterns of reasoning and organization. And then we build on that. You might remember in elementary school, like making little pictures that helped arrange and organize your ideas. And there was a progression of ideas that became your reasoning. Well, uh, in AP language, I hope you're complicating some of that, not forgetting it, but complicating it. And I hope when you get into college writing, um, that you'll be able to continue um, continue on that particular path because there is a relationship between reasoning and organization. They're not the same thing, but there's a relationship between them. So in terms of structure patterns for my own um, presentation today, I'm gonna talk very quickly about numbers one and two, formulaic and formalistic approaches um, to organization and reasoning, um, move quickly through methods of development, and then my main content today, it's about the same amount of time that I'll, I'll cover uh, each of these, but the main thing that I wanna to contribute today to your thinking, and I would challenge you to think about, are these adaptable approaches, thinking about um, reasoning and organization in terms of uh, tools, strategies, form and function, the good eye, the curious eye, and flexibility. Uh, so this just gives you a bit of an overview of where I'm gonna to go today in the short time that we have together. The first thing that I'll talk about is formula or formulaic. And again, I'll, I'll think back to other disciplines and it's rarely a compliment in English to say that someone's writing is formulaic, that you use a formula to write. In other disciplines, I can't imagine that would be the case again. Um, in math, you have formulas that you learn. In chemistry, you have formulas. Um, what what um, chemistry teacher is not going to tell you that formulas um, that are, what, what chemistry teachers can tell you that, for, that formulas are a bad thing, right? You use formulas to understand relationships and, and to understand molecules and all these kinds of things. Yet in writing, when we talk about formulaic and formalistic approaches, sometimes that's a bit of a, maybe a derogatory statement. And I wanna um, talk about a little bit by why some of these formulas and formalistic approaches might be good starting places, but maybe would be something that you'd wanna build upon as you become a more, um, advanced and sophisticated writer. First of all, I just want to touch on, I don't want to dismiss any of these formulas or formulaic approaches. Um, there are advantages. It gives us something very concrete to learn and to teach. Um, that's maybe one of the frustrating things when you have something like an English class, like a writing class, it's like what are we learning in here? What are the, what's the knowledge base? Um, uh, I do think writing is a content area and we have content that we teach, but it doesn't always look the same as history where you have certain things that you absolutely need to know, or, or math where you learn certain kinds of skills and principles. Um, but formulas and formalistic approaches do give us something specific to sort of learn and to hang our hat on when it comes to that. Also, um, there are certain formulaic and formalistic approaches that work really well in certain contexts. And honestly, a timed writing exam might be one of those contexts where a formula sort of uh, helps you because it's a high stakes, high pressure environment and um, you've been answering a lot of questions and you're tired and, uh, and there's something nice to being able to go back and think, okay, I have a formula to go back to for my writing. Um, I did actually fairly well in high school and, um, and early college writing with certain kinds of um, formulas. I didn't call them formulas at the time, but I sort of structured every single one of my papers the same way and it was successful for me and my mother was a high school English teacher, so I had decent grammar and punctuation. And, um, and so I used sort of the same thing over and over again until a writing professor challenged me to think about 
maybe expanding my repertoire so I didn't, didn't go back to the same formula every single time. So they are a good starting place. If you're learning some of these formulas or formulistic approaches, formulaic approaches, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to learn, but I would say it's maybe a starting place. And when it comes to these first two points that I'm talking about, formulaic and formalistic approaches, I don't actually talk about these much in my college writing classes. I sort of figure you've gotten a lot of this from elementary school all the way through middle school and even into high school. And I know some of your AP teachers will tell you hey, it's time to move on from some of these things. And if that's what they've told you, that's, that's fine. And if you're doing some of this work, that's fine too. But there's a sense of there's more to it than this, right? What are the disadvantages to formulaic or formalistic approaches? Well, it sort of communicates again that there's this one size fits all approach to writing. No matter what the writing situation is, you're gonna write X, Y, and Z. You, you've already been told ahead of time before you even see the, the topic or the approach, like here's how you set up your argument. Here's how, here's what each paragraph should have in it. The first sentence should be such and such. The second sentence should be the next thing. You know, never have less than, uh, fewer than, uh, you know, two or three sentences in a paragraph. And so it, it sort of communicates that there's a single kind of form or formula that you can go back to at the end. And the sort of ignores context and audience and purpose. And we don't want you to ignore those things. That's why you talk about rhetorical situation early on in an AP language class or in a college writing class, because we want you to analyze whether you call it rhetorical situation. I hope you're analyzing audiences and purposes and contexts and all these kind of the rich um, surroundings to any particular piece of writing. And also formalistic or formulaic approaches sort of give us an inaccurate sense of process. And what I mean by that is like, there's a sense that I have to write something and then I write something else and then I go to something else. In my real writing, uh, and again, this probably doesn't work as well for timed writing exams, but I rarely start at the beginning. Um, I go back to my text over and over and over and I start things or I write a first paragraph that I know is gonna be a throwaway paragraph because I rarely write well in my first paragraph. But I just do that to sort of get the cobwebs out and start writing. And then what a real writing process looks like is a lot of revision, going back and redoing things and editing and moving things around and, and cutting and pasting. And it's not about just fitting A, B, C and moving on from that. So probably the simplest formula that, um, that you might look at would be the five paragraph essay, which is you know, often derided by writing teachers. Honestly, you know, there's nothing particular that, that is absolutely wrong with a five paragraph essay. Again, um, it's just become the default for so many of us. And, and again, maybe that is something that, you, that could help you in a timed writing test like the AP exam. Um, you'll see if you're looking at scores of exams that your teachers are showing you throughout the years, you'll find five paragraph essays that score well, and you'll find five paragraph essays that don't, don't score well. So it's not the form or the formula, but it's sort of the simplest formula. If you haven't learned this in the past, it's probably important to learn at some point what an introduction, three body paragraphs, and a conclusion um, can include. And there might be different things um, that you would do within those paragraphs. Again, probably not a, a bad place to start, um, but it's probably also not the place that you want to end as a writer either. I mean, there's got to be more to writing than this five paragraph essay. And if this is sort of the default, uh, imagine how limited it would be. I'll go back to my example of my son playing the guitar. Let's imagine he only learns four chords and he's getting really good at those four chords. I would hope that his guitar teacher or that he would on his own want to take those four chords and start doing something more with it. If he just stayed with those four chords his whole life as a guitarist, he's not going to play very interesting music. It's, it's not, he's not going to sound, uh, you know, he's not going to get better. And so should he not learn his chords? Of course he should learn his chords. Um, but at, at the same time, he wants to learn those chords and then move on to something that's a little bit more complicated, a little bit more nuanced, uh, sounds a little bit better, more complicated. And of course, that's what you want to do uh, with your writing. You start with the sort of basic idea of what paragraphs are and how you might introduce paragraphs, um, and then you move on from those. Um, and so it's not a bad thing, but it's very possible that your teachers have sort of already told you that, hey, if you've already sort of gotten this under your belt and you've had years and years of writing these five paragraph essays, it might be time in your, um, in your writing um, to move beyond that. And you'll certainly hear that. I hear that from college teachers all the time. This say, please, 
no more five paragraph essays. And of course that makes sense in college because you're writing much longer texts, you're writing more complicated texts, you're not under, I don't know many uh, college writing classes that have timed writing situations anymore. You might have certain exams or whatever that, uh, that might have that. But for the most part in college, we work on pieces of writing for multiple weeks at a time. Um, they're longer, more complicated texts and the five paragraph essay just doesn't suffice for that more complicated um, writing work. So it's very possible that um, if you are looking at more specific formal approaches to writing that you're learning about toolmen, um, that you might be um, learning other kinds of approaches. And these are argument methods. Um, toolmen is interesting. We have Rogerian, which we'll look at in just a second here, a classical method. And what you see is they're still formalistic, right? They have certain forms. You start with the arguments and you move to support your evidence and, uh, and sort of what the data has to show. And I would say these are more advanced, right? This is clearly a more advanced setup than, um, than a five paragraph essay. And you have different parts. And what, I'll, what we'll see with all three of these that I'm just gonna show briefly. And again, I don't teach these in my class anymore. I used to teach a little bit of formal argument like this, but I don't as much anymore. I think students are pretty good about this. Um, is that um, there, it, it, there's a little bit more reasoning here. There's a little bit more progression. So your organization leads to the reasoning and like you first make some claims and then you show your grounds and then you go and, and, and you make uh, warrants and back. And so it has an order to it and it's a logical order. It's still pretty, um, it doesn't have to be, but it tends to be presented as sort of lockstep, but it does sort of um, connect organization and reasoning in ways that I think are helpful and um, and shows you that um, that the paragraph should have a progressive order and there should be a relationship between the parts. The Rogerian method is oftentimes taught if you're learning about toolman, you'll probably learn about the Rogerian method as well. This is sort of the more cooperative form of argument. It's maybe a little bit less masculinist, what we might call. It's not as combative. It's not about you know, beating somebody else, but it's about um, maybe acknowledging the value of other people's um, claims and support, but then saying why yours might be better in this particular context. And so again, there's sort of a form that you go through where you, you give credit to opposing positions and some context, and then you give your own position and explain why adopting your position at this particular moment is the right kind of thing. Again, if you're learning uh, Rogerian method, if you're learning tool, excuse me, toolman approaches, I think that's, um, that's a, it's an interesting way to think about uh, reasoning and organization. The classical method, which we bring back, you know, to the, the ancient Greeks, um, fifth century BCE, you have, um, you know, the same kinds of things with um, introductions and claims and main points and positive and negative proofs and counter arguments. So you see a lot of the same parts here. They're just sort of arranged a little bit differently, or they may be, they may emphasize something that is a little bit different um, from the other things. But they do, again, teach you about reasoning. They teach you about structure. Um, in this kind of case, you may also be looking at um, logical fallacies. I've had a fun time in my classes over the years talking about logical fallacies. So if this is sort of good reasoning, what are bad, what, what are bad reasoning points? You know, attacking the person, um, creating a, a weaker argument for someone else, and then attacking that argument, getting people off topic, um, you know, joining things. So there's, there's a lot of um, really smart ways that you can approach these sort of formal and formulaic uh, approaches to writing. Again, do I do much of this in my writing classes? I don't think so because, um, well, I don't because that, um, again, I, I don't really teach form in this kind of direct way. And I think you probably have had some good experience in this in the past, with this in the past. If I were doing this, I think I'd bring it to um, certain things that I, you know, I would try to connect this to, to conversations that I actually have in my own home. Um, these, um, these PowerPoints that we're putting together ha have to go through certain kinds of copyright. And so I was not able to put the exact pictures that I wanted to uh, on the slide here, but these are actually topics that I talk about in my home to my family. I have two 20 year old uh, twins and a 16 year old. Um, and we talk about things like, what's the best chicken sandwich out there? Is it Popeye's, is it Chick-fil-A, is it Wendy's? Who has the best chicken sandwich, right? And if you wanted to do something, you could go back and you could look at like, what would Toolman, how would Toolman approach that? How would the Rogerian approach look, a classical approach? And you could see by taking on some of these topics that, um, that you can sort of internalize and learn what some of that structure looks like. That generic football field, if I had my way, that would be Lambeau Field up in um, Green Bay. 
Uh, we're Packer fans in my family, and we go way back. So we could talk about uh, drafting a particular quarterback while we have one of the best quarterbacks in the league, or we could talk about any number of things with Packer football in our house. And again, we could practice. We could go back uh, to some of those forms and say, what, how would the structure look like if you made it uh, a classical argument? How would it be different if you took a Rogerian approach or a Toulmin approach? In music, we love music in my family, everything from playing music to watching uh, music to singing. And so um, I'll bring in Hamilton a little bit later. We're big 80s fans. And so we like our bands and we like our, uh, you know, U2 and all these kinds of bands. And so we're always talking about music and we're making arguments about music. You name it, uh, fantasy, we love Star Wars, Harry Potter, all these kinds of things. So if you wanted to practice these kinds of arguments and you thought, ah, formalistic approaches to, um, you know, to argument, they're so dry and boring, uh, do it with some topics that you actually care about, uh, write about some topics that you care about. One of the things that I love in writing class is that we oftentimes let you all write about topics that are interesting to you and engaging to you. And then we, we teach uh, reasoning and organization and structure uh, through all of that. So I'm, I won't spend a lot more time on formulaic approaches. Having been to the um, AP language readings for a long time, we do talk a lot about formulas and we see these kinds of things year after year, ethos, logos, and pathos, syntax and diction, all the kinds of things that we see as formalistic approaches. Again, they're not necessarily wrong, um, but there is this kind of sense of, um, you know, ha is it helpful for what you're actually trying to do? Um, um, it might work in a, this kind of timed high, stake, high stakes uh, writing environment, but when you get to college writing, when you get to writing in the, in the work world or in a professional context, uh, again, you don't want to forget these kind of formalistic or formulaic approaches, but they probably won't serve your purposes very well there. You have to learn this adaptability and uh, you have to sort of build on it and move on and, um, and get into some uh, more complex ways of, uh, of thinking and structuring. So if you're able, move past these formalistic approaches. And if this is where you're at, and this is what's gonna help you on the exam, uh, you know, this is for you and your teacher to talk about in terms of the strategies that you put forward. I only have one real slide about this methods of development and reasoning, and I'll go through it quickly, even though I think it's actually quite an interesting topic. When I first started teaching writing 25 years ago, the approach that we were using um, in for most writing uh, classes that, that I was being taught was what we call modes-based writing. And modes meant that we would learn the narrative essay. We would learn the cause and effect essay. We would learn a compare and contrast essay and so forth, right? So we would learn um, these methods of development that you're probably talking about in your classes as a type of essay that has a particular structure. And again, we would teach students that, okay, for a narrative, you want to start at this point and then move to this, and here's what your paragraph should have. And if you're going to compare and contrast, you do an AAA or a BBB or an ABAB or something like this, right? So it was very kind of, again, formulaic and formalistic. Um, is there anything wrong with that per se? No. I mean, all of these things have rules and formulas and it can help teach you I still use some of the things like how to, how to write a good definition. I think of some of those early writing classes that I taught and I learned how to define terms uh, fairly well by thinking about the, those, those kinds of essays. Um, and again, it gives you a little bit of something like a starting place. But again, I don't think any of the writers that you're gonna be reading um, started off their day thinking, hey, this is Gandhi. I'm gonna write a compare and contrast essay today. Or this is Martin Luther King Jr. saying, hey, I think in my sermon today, I'm going to use a definitional essay. No, but they might actually use compare and contrast or definition, um, but they don't like learn that as a formulistic kind of structure. Um, so the modes sort of teach these things as essays, like they have a set structure that you actually have to go into. Um, but really, um, it can still go back to a lot of rules and formulas. The same is true with the bullets on the other side of the slide. I think learning deductive and inductive logic is actually quite useful for a writing teacher, or for a writing, uh, for a writer, a student. You think about either moving from like more general points to specific and testing certain kinds of theories, or moving from the more specific to the general. We actually talk about this quite a bit in my graduate uh, research methods classes. Um, how do you create knowledge in writing studies? Do you start with larger theories and test them? Or do you generate theory by finding specific examples and, and diving deep into this? So nothing wrong with any of these things. And I think they're all helpful. 
um, but I'm going to put it in a different kind of context in just a few minutes here. So my, my big point, and again, this is not going to take any longer than the others, but this is sort of my takeaway for you all today, is approaching um, writing as adaptable, right? As needing to make changes, understanding that there's not a single right way to do this. So I'm going to talk about three things or four things briefly. Thinking about these kinds of things as tools and strategies, form following function, thinking about what a good and curious eye is, and then finally sort of a meta piece, which is flexibility and variation, which is which I guess are sort of synonymous with adaptable. So first, um, tools and strategies. I think of um, whether it's methods of development or certain kinds of um, structural kinds of arguments or any of the reasoning that you might use, inductive, deductive, exemplification, any of those things, I think of those not as forms and formulas, but as tools and strategies. I'll tell you what, um, I've never walked into my garage, into my toolbox and grabbed a pair of pliers and walked into the house saying, hey, I wanna use my pliers today. What job can I do with these pliers? We don't start with the tool and then figure out the job. And also, um, you know, I, I want many tools in my toolbox, right? I don't wanna go out in my garage and only have a set of pliers because then when I have to hammer a nail in or uh, cut, a, cut a piece of wood or something like that, I'm not actually very handy, so this isn't a great metaphor for me, but um, you know, I, I wanna have more, I wanna have the right tools for the job, right? And so I start with the job, what I want to do. And then I think about my tools as having, as having potential to complete that job. Another way you might think about it would be uh, strategies. Um, think about maybe sports, um, sports teams. If you're a football team and you have one play, one strategy that you're gonna run over and over and over again, think of how limiting that's going to be in a particular game. I'm a pretty lousy chess player in part because I don't have multiple strategies. I sort of have my first couple moves mapped out. I, I'm sort of a one way to play chess kind of person. And then uh, after that, I have no flexibility. I can't adapt to what's going on. Uh, I stick with those particular um, strategies. So if you think about like narration and compare and contrast and, um, you know, exemplification, different kinds of arguments, even Toolman and, and Rogerian and classical and all those things as tools or strategies that you have at your disposal, that's a little bit more interesting. Again, then you're thinking of, being, thinking of it less as like, okay, I'm gonna write a compare and contrast essay. And you're thinking, is there a comparison that I can make here in my writing that will help my reader understand the point that I'm making more? And what you find, just like tools, if you have a more complex job that you're doing, it's one thing if I'm just hammering in a nail, um, then I'm gonna get my hammer and I'm gonna put it into the wall, right? And hang a picture. That's sort of maybe what the five paragraph essay is, a hammer nailing it into the wall. But what if I have a more complex job? What if I'm fixing a porch or what if I'm trying to make a, a little table? Well, I'm gonna need multiple tools, right? I'm gonna need multiple, um, multiple things at my disposal because the more complex the job, the more tools that I'm gonna need. Same thing is true for you as a writer. Um, you're gonna need more tools at, at your disposal um, as you have more complex writing situations. You're gonna want to be able to use comparison, inductive reasoning, uh, certain kinds of logic, um, understanding different approaches to introductions and how you might approach introductions differently in different contexts, right? You're gonna want to use more of those things more often. And you'll find that a single piece of writing uh, might have multiple strategies that are going on in it. That's sort of what you do in your rhetorical analysis essay, right? You're looking at actual pieces of writing, actual speeches, actual letters that people have written, and you're finding that they're using multiple tools, multiple strategies, and they're sort of stringing those things together, um, and they're finding the right tool or the right strategy for the job. So think about what you're learning in writing, not as a one, one tool, I'm going to use this hammer, whether it's the right instrument or not, and think about it as one of many tools that you'll want to develop. And the more tools you can develop proficiency with, the better, um, the more options you have as a writer uh, to be a stronger writer. My second point, form follows function. This is a, this is a term I think that comes from architecture. Um, I'm sort of an HGTV um, watcher. I watch that in the evenings when I'm tired. I watch that or the Food Network probably, but I love HG, HGTV. Right. And so if you watch HGTV or some kind of, um, you know, building network or whatever the different things that are out there, what you've learned is that everybody wants an open floor plan these days. 
And so me, I want an open floor plan too, right? Because I see all these really cool houses get sort of transformed and they have this open floor plan, which means that your kitchen and living room and office space, they're all connected and everyone sort of working in the same spaces and you can see each other. And I sort of imagine what, you know, my house could never look like this. I don't have anything close to this, but um, you, you know, you start to imagine this house that has this open floor plan. Well, my wife, who's quite a bit smarter than I, right? She's gonna tell me, Michael, we don't want an open floor plan. That doesn't fit our needs at all as a family. I told you before, we have uh, two 20 year olds and a 16 year old. We have a single TV in our house. Uh, we have computers and all these kinds of things. We were home together for the last six months because of uh, the COVID situation. If we had an open floor plan, that would be disastrous for us because that doesn't actually meet our needs. Um, we want, we, if we think of how our family functions, we need smaller spaces where we can have some privacy. Only one out of the five of us is an extrovert. We need our own spaces to grade, to watch TV, to relax, to, uh, to cook, to do all the things that we do. And so I was getting the function, um, I was looking at the form first rather than the function. As a writer, we sometimes start with forms. Again, we start with certain modes of development or strategies or ethos, logos, and pathos, or uh, you know whatever it is that we're looking at, induction, deduction, Rogerian arguments. We start with the form, and then we try to make the function fit. But the form should always follow the function. You think about what it is that you want to accomplish. What is it that you'd actually need to do? Um, uh, and then your form should actually be in line. That's why, again, this is, I think, the fifth unit in your, your, your AP class, right? Because you want to look at, at function first. You want to look at purpose and context and, and the history of something and different genres and what your audiences might look like. Um, the function should be first and the form should fit the function. Just like the tool should fit the job, the form should fit the function. My third of four points. Um, I teach visual rhetoric. It's one of my favorite classes here at Florida State. And we have, uh, an, it's an upper level class in our editing, writing and media major because um, uh, many of our students are going into media-based writing. We do video essays, we do web design, all kinds of things like that. Well, we talk about the good and the curious eye in visual rhetoric. And I think it can apply to, um, uh, to our, our writing classes as well, more traditional writing classes. What is a good eye? A good eye sees detail. A good eye is trained, it has, it's, it's expert. It sees things that, um, that maybe others don't see because you've trained it to see those things. So let me give you an example. I told you in my family, we love music. Uh, this year I watched Hamilton with my family and I have a sister-in-law who is a professional um, musician. She's in, in musical theater and she has seen Hamilton multiple times. I've seen it once, I've heard some of the songs um, but I, you know, I'm seeing it first, right? She is seeing, even though we're watching the same thing uh, on the TV screen, she is seeing a different production. Why is that? Because she has a trained good eye. She sort of know, knows things and notices things that I might not see. My eye is quite overwhelmed, as overwhelmed as my ears are at that fast music, right? And so I'm trying to listen, I'm trying to see, but there's so much kind of visual and, and um, auditory information happening that the trained eye can see something well. Well, what do I see well? It may sound boring to you all, but I, I study and I look at postcards, historic postcards. And I can look at postcards because I've been looking at them for about uh, 10 years now. And I can see details in postcards that I have some level of expertise and I can see them. I can see certain features that I can tell something about maybe where it was produced or how it was produced or know something about the context and the history. We talked about sports examples before. Um, I might go to an FSU football game and I've been seeing enough of these to like, we know certain lineups. Um, we, we see certain things and, and we notice them because we're fans and um, same thing, you know, with, with whatever, uh, whatever other, um, whatever other things that you see or, or do. Um, what's the connection to writing? I'd really like to encourage you to develop a good eye for reasoning and organization. I think sometimes reasoning and organization sort of gets left out of some of our writing instruction, especially if we have formula formulaic and formalistic approaches to writing. So we don't really see and notice what good writing looks like. 
what a really interesting organization or what a really complex line of reasoning might look like. You're going to be reading some of the most interesting and 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 um, and powerful nonfiction texts, you know, that uh, that we have available to us. They're political, or they might be, um, uh, you know, connected to um, religion or society. Um, you know, introductions to books, eulogies. You see all these kinds of texts, and they're really beautifully written. They're well crafted. But I think if you don't take a moment and pause and think about um, think about how it's crafted to sort of notice the detail. When I first read something, I just have to read it for content at first, again, because my brain is a meaning making machine. So I look at that and I look at it for, um, um, for content first. But then I go back and I look at what's the line of reasoning here? How is it organized? Is this different from the way that I might organize my own writing? Can I learn something from it? One, you'll see this idea immediately that I talked about earlier, that there's no one size fits all for writing. They do it in radically different and interesting ways. So what's the curious eye? After you've developed a good eye, the curious eye is someone who can look at it and ask questions. I wonder why Abigail Adams did this in this particular point here. I wonder why Gandhi made this kind of argument to this particular person in this particular content uh, context. And that leads to sort, sort of a deeper analysis than just sort of locating random rhetorical concepts and writing about them in a rhetorical analysis essay, right? It leads to something that's really important. So read for content, but then go back and read for organization, read for logic, read for reasoning and evidence and conclusions and how they string together their pieces. And I hope that you can develop both a good and a curious eye. And so getting toward the end here, flexibility and variation. Um, again, this is about adaptability, right? This is about um, the more flexible you are, the more adaptable you are, the more variation um, that you can use, that you can, um, you can try different strategies in different kinds of ways. One of the things that I enjoy most about college writing is when I tell students that it's okay to take risks. You've been sort of told most of the time in your academic life and in, in, in K through uh, 12, don't take risks, just do it this way. Don't ask questions, just do it. And I love to have students take some risks and to try some things, to experiment with things. Even if they don't work, try it anyway. I'll reward you for trying, right? So there's this idea that um, you want to build in some level of adaptability. Now, again, there are times to experiment and there are times that aren't. You know, if, if I'm writing a, a letter to try to get a promotion or tenure or something like that, I don't want to move out of the box and try something creative that no one else has tried in the university before. I want to go back to those tried and true formulas that have worked to get people tenure and promotion in my university. But there are other times that I can experiment and try some different things. Life is so much richer with variety. Do we always love the same foods day after day? Do we like to listen to the same music day after day, year after year? Um, do you like the same conversations over and over again? Do you watch the same shows over and over again? No, we want variety. Variety um, stimulates our brains and it gives us something new to think about. Um, can you do this as a writer? Can you think this way as a writer to sort of understand, yes, there are some building blocks that you're learning with your, um, with your high school writing, but that, that there is some, to learn to be flexible and, and, and to have some variety and really push yourself as a writer, maybe into some uncharted territory. I'll end with this. Um, there's a, a statement called the WPA Writing Program Administrator's Outcome Statement. And this is a document created a number of years ago and it's been through uh, several different revisions, but outcomes in educational speak are just like, what do students need to be able to do by the time they finish our writing courses? And we have four main areas that we think about, rhetorical knowledge, critical thinking, reading and writing, process and knowledge conventions. But I've pulled out a couple bullets from each of those areas just to show variation the ability to have flexibility and, and to try different things is actually built into these outcomes. So we learn to um, use rhetorical concepts, analyzing and composing a variety of texts. I love AP language because you should be seeing a variety of texts. You should be seeing different kinds and lengths and difficulties of texts, and you need to be able to understand and analyze different types of texts. Develop facility in responding to various situations and contexts. You don't want to write the same thing for a a science lab report as you're writing for your philosophy paper, there's a lot of different situations and contexts that you're going to need to learn. Flexible strategies for reading, writing, 
um, drafting, reviewing, all these things that we talked about earlier. It's okay to come up with some patterns if you have a certain thing that helps you as a writer sort of generate some text, but you're always gonna have to have some amount of flexibility with your strategies. And of course, um, understanding genre conventions for structure, paragraphing, tone, and mechanics, they vary, they're different. There's not this one size fits all. There's one kind of writing that you have to learn and then you sort of arrived. Yes, there's a particular kind of writing that will help you on the AP exam and you learn to write that and write it well so you can get the scores that you want on those exams. But you have to understand that's not the be all and end all of writing. And that no, do I, do I want you to forget what you've learned when you come to college, um, regardless of what you score on those? Absolutely not. But I do want you to build on it. I do want you to develop adaptable, flexible strategies so that you can take where you are as a writer and continue to improve. So I hope you've, uh, you're being challenged right now in AP language. Uh, I hope that we'll continue to challenge you when you get into college to improve and, um, and to uh, learn different types of writings regardless of where you are. Um, but specifically when we're thinking of organization and reasoning, I hope that you develop sort of a habit of mind, a way of thinking that isn't located in just finding a one size fits all approach to writing when it comes to organization and reasoning and find something that, um, that will be a, a way of thinking that will challenge you and help you grow as a writer uh, in AP writing, in college writing and beyond. So thanks so much for your time. Good luck to you this year.